Thanks for checking out the message this week. Today we're kicking off a brand new series called High Five, The Power of Positive Relationships. You know, God has created us to have powerful, positive relationships with other people just as He has uh, created us to have that relationship with Him. And listen, if you're ready to take your relationships to another level, this series, High Five, a five-week study from the book of Philemon, is going to inspire you and challenge you to take your relationships to another level. And God's going to do some great things in your life today. We're talking about affirmative action. How can we build other people up by our words, our deeds, our actions, our prayers, and really all that we do. Today, be blessed, be affirmed, and encouraged today as we talk about week one, affirmative action. Hey, good to see you this morning. Reach over and give somebody a high five next to you. Feels good, doesn't it? All right, you guys need to wake up just a little bit. I know everybody's kind of depressed after the game yesterday, but, you know, but it'll be okay. I mean, you know, there's always next year, and it's kind of weird to think that Tebow took us deeper into the playoffs than Peyton, but anyway, just, anyway, you can just think about that for a little bit. <clears throat> okay, good to see you, man. Hey, today we're kicking off this brand new series called A High Five. We're going to be going through the whole book of Philemon. We're going to be talking about developing positive and dynamic relationships. And, you know, the high five is something we love in the Heller family. We give high fives all the time. We love to give high fives whenever we say something that's funny, or at least something that we think is funny. We were giving high fives to our kids when they were potty training. You know, it was a great motivator. I love to give high fives on the basketball court when somebody hits a big shot. High fives are that ultimate sign of affirmation, aren't they? And great relationships. We're going to be looking at these five aspects of dynamic relationships as we walk through the book of Philemon verse by verse over the next five weeks. And listen, I hope that you're going to be here. I hope you're going to make a commitment today that you're going to be here every single week because it's going to be an unbelievable time. In fact, next week we're going to talk about win-win relationships. How can you win? How can I win? How can we win together? So that's just a little precursor for next week. But today we're talking about affirmation. And you know, relationships are so important because there's so much loneliness in the world today. You know, people are lonely, single people, married people, old people, young people, people in between. Doesn't matter what age or what background you come from, people struggle with loneliness everywhere we turn. We, we live in a city of millions of people, and yet people are still lonely. Isn't that amazing to think about? God has some incredible things to say to us today about how we can find significant relationships with one another that are centered in his word that can bring fulfillment and joy to us in, in a wonderful and a powerful day, way. And we got to go retro this morning to really begin to understand relationships. In fact, I love the 1980s. Do we have any 80s fans in the house? Love the 80s. Okay, all three of us. Okay, great. Very good. Well, one of the greatest inventions of the 1980s was the plasma ball. And the plasma ball... Plasma ball may have died just a, wow. Oh, you got to turn it on all the way. Okay. I had the warning switch on. Plasma ball is so cool. There's these gases involved in this, and I'm not an engineer, but there's these little gases and stuff. You're not supposed to take this apart when you go home, by the way. And there's electrical, uh, electrical current, electromagnetic waves that are swirling in here. And check this out. This is so cool. Okay, this is what you did in the 80s when you didn't have anything else to do. You touch it, right? And you know, if you touch it long enough, it'll burn your finger. Thing gets kind of hot. It makes kind of a cool little sound. Kind of hear it swirling around there. And this is what's really cool. You can, wherever you move your finger, wherever the touch is, is where the current is conducted. So the finger works kind of as a conduit, and you can actually do it with two fingers, or you can get tricky, three or four fingers. All works together. In fact, my kids were having fun doing this yesterday, and this is what they came up with. <laughs> they were conducting it with their noses. You know? That looks like great fun, doesn't it? But you know, it's sensitive to the power of touch. It's kind of like relationships. When we begin to, to affirm others, power is released. The power of touch. When we build other people up, what happens? Relationships are strengthened. Power is released. And so the power of our touch is so significant when it comes to building interpersonal relationships. Paul spoke of this in the book of Philemon. And I want you to go with me 
to Philemon chapter 1. It actually is the only chapter. Verse 1. The Bible says this letter is from Paul, a prisoner, for preaching the good news about Christ Jesus and from our brother Timothy. I'm writing to Philemon, our beloved co-worker, and our sister Aphia, and our fellow soldier Art Archippus, and the church that meets in your home. May God the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. So Paul opens this letter up. This is kind of what you call the intro, verses 1 through 3. And there's three main characters going on in the book of Philemon that you have to understand to, to kind of get what's going on. There's Paul, the author. There's Philemon, the recipient. And there's Onesimus, the runaway slave. Now, it's interesting that Paul is imprisoned in Rome, and yet he meets this man, Onesimus, who was a runaway slave that worked in the household of Philemon. So, so, so Philemon, he lives in the city of Colossae, and the slave Onesimus runs away, and in the sovereignty of God, he actually meets the apostle Paul, not knowing that Paul was the spiritual father of Philemon, his slave owner. Is that not incredible? And in the ancient world, in the biblical world, slave, slavery was a little bit different than what we know it today in our own context. In fact, a lot of people that were slaves were indentured servants. If you were in debt or you needed to take out a loan, you know, they didn't have credit cards. So you would agree to go work for somebody for a certain period of time, and then you would be released when that debt was paid off. It's obvious in the passage that Onesimus has run off, and he's probably stolen some stuff from Philemon along the way. He gets to Rome. He meets Paul. He becomes a follower of Christ, not knowing that Paul had led Philemon to Christ. And Paul says to him, Onesimus, listen, you've broken your contract. You need to go back and reconcile this broken relationship with Philemon, your boss, and I want to encourage you to do so. And Onesimus probably pushed back a little bit and said, hey, they could take my life, you know, because in the ancient world, if you were a run runaway slave, you, you, you could lose your, use your life, but lose your life. But, but Paul says, listen, Philemon is a man of God. He's reasonable, and I'm going to write a great letter of recommendation to you to back you up along the way to help you go back and resolve this. So Onesimus goes, letter in hand, and gives this to Philemon, and Paul goes to bat for his new brother in Christ, Onesimus, to talk to Philemon, the man that he had run away from. So that's what's going on. And Paul builds Philemon up. He builds him up. Affirmative words, affirmative action. Affirmation is such a significant part of relationships. It's no coincidence that Paul opens the letter by building Philemon up. You know, a lot of times in relationships, what we do is we ask people to do a favor for us, which Paul is about to do in a few verses, but without uh, investing in the relationship and affirming somebody before we ask them to do something for us. Do you guys understand what I'm saying? It's easy to ask somebody to do something for you, but if you don't have the relationship in order, if, it's, if the foundation's not poured, then it's difficult to motivate somebody to want to help you. Paul is building the relationship. He already has a great relationship, but he is building the relationship. He begins by affirming Philemon for all of the great things that he has done. And he affirms him in three ways. In fact, there's three keys to building others up. And I just believe our marriages would be different. Our families would be different. Our lives would be different. Our church would be different. All phases of the game, all aspects of our life would be different if we could learn to really affirm people as the Apostle Paul does in the life of Philemon. And that begins with acts of kindness, the deeds, the, the actions, actions that we do, actions that affirm. In verse 7, Paul says, I myself have gained much joy and comfort from your love, my brother, because your kindness has so often refreshed the hearts of God's people. And so he says, Philemon, listen, the way that you serve other people is, and the way that you build them up is a blessing and your actions are incredible. You know, it's interesting, this word that's used here for refresh is a word that means in the language of the New Testament to relieve pain. Paul is saying, Philemon, the actions that you carry out are relieving the burdens, relieving the pain of people that are suffering and hurting. And you know, when we begin to serve other people, that's what we do. We see somebody that's hurting. We see somebody that's struggling. We see somebody that's having a hard time. We begin to serve them. We begin to invest in them. We begin to bless them in some way. What happens? The result of that is that their pain is relieved. So Paul says, Philemon, your ministry, your deeds are like extra strength Tylenol, man. They are knocking out. 
the pain that is felt. It's interesting that kindness is mentioned in the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5.22. The scripture goes on and it says that, you know, that kindness is just part of what we do. You know, that's just the normal, normal pattern of everything. But when the Holy Spirit controls our lives, he will produce this kind of fruit in us. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and self-control. That's just the normal thing. And listen, when the Holy Spirit is in your life, serving and loving other people should just be the normal flow. You know, it shouldn't be the exception. It should be the norm. It should be what we're doing all the time. Just part of the Holy Spirit's work in our lives. And Paul looks at Philemon and he says, you have done a great job in this. Paul affirms the Philippian church in Philippians 4.16. He says this, even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent help more than once. I don't say this because I want a gift from you. What I want is for you to receive a well-earned reward because of your kindness. And Paul says, listen, you affirmed me by your giving. The Macedonian church was generous. They were, they were gracious. They gave to Paul to, to sustain his ministry. And, and their acts affirmed him and built him up. And our acts affirm others as well. Several months ago, I was talking with Gina and I said, babe, you're just doing a great job with the kids and your leadership in our church and, you know, our household. And, you know, can I help you with something? Because you're just doing all this stuff. You're doing a great job. Can I help you with something? It was kind of one of those things that I said, guys, and maybe you've said this before if you're married, where you, you kind of say it and then you think, oh, my goodness, what have I just opened myself up to, right? I was thinking, man, I'm going to have two hours of chores around the house, you know. I mean, do you really want to know, you know? And uh, I was a little nervous. I thought Gina was going to ask me to take up sewing, you know, or something like that. Take up laundry. You know, I'm not against laundry, but the last time I washed clothes, I turned all of Gina's white lingerie pink. It was, it was really a pretty pink. I, I washed them with, you know, red t-shirts and all that kind of stuff. And so I've been kind of banned from the washing machine for, for a number of years. But nonetheless, you know, hey, I was ready to take it on. If I needed to do a little laundry, so be it. But she came back and she said something that was interesting, something that I, I was kind of surprised by, something that I wouldn't have thought was a big deal. She said, I hate to unload the dishwasher. You know, can you just take the dishes and just put them away? I thought, yeah, I could do that. I mean, that's not like my favorite thing to do, but it's not like a huge commitment. Of course, you know, I could do that. If that makes you feel good and you love that, then absolutely I'll do that. Now, I can't guarantee that I get everything in its specific place, but... You know, the dishwasher is unloaded. My wife has a very uh, complex system of where cups and plates and forks and everything go. And, you know, but everything gets put somewhere, okay, in the Heller household. And it's good. And you know what? It blesses her, and she, she feels good with it. And, and it's a way that I can serve my wife in a way that I would have never thought of. But if that makes her feel good, then awesome. Paul says, I want to relieve the pain. I want to relieve the stress. I want, I want you to continue doing what you're doing, Philemon, because it's a blessing to people. And you know what? One of the great ways we can begin to really ramp our relationships up is to affirm other people by our actions. So who has God put in your life that you could serve? Who, who, who could you be uh, doing kind things for at a higher level than you've been doing? Who could you show Christian love to in a way that is profound? This was exactly the ministry of Jesus all, all the way through the New Testament Jesus is serving people he's building people up he's washing the disciples feet in John chapter 13 before his arrest Jesus said if you want to be great in the kingdom of God become the least the, the least shall be the greatest if you want to be the greatest in the kingdom of, of God be a servant the first will be last and the last will be first so what are we doing you know, we can affirm and build people up and not say anything just by virtue of what we do and the way we conduct ourselves and the way we help people. But Paul goes on and he says there's a second thing, and that is not only acts of kindness but also our prayers. Did you know you can build people up by your praying? Notice what he says here in verses 4 through 6. I always thank my God as I remember you in my prayers because I hear about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints. And I pray that you may be active in sharing your faith so that you will have a full understanding of every 
good thing that we have in Christ. So in other words, prayers that affirm. Prayers that affirm. Prayers build people up. And notice he says, he prays all the time. Look at the beginning of verse 4. I always thank God. Paul says, man, I am praying, and I am praying, and I am praying. And it's just the normal pattern. It's what I do all the time. I am always praying praying I'm praying continually and notice what he prayed in verse 6 he said listen he said I pray that you would be active in sharing your faith it's an interesting thing isn't it that, that's a prayer that I pray for the edge church is that we would be the kind of people that are always sharing our faith with other people and I love it to see you bring your friends to, to the edge church and bring your friends to the high five series and and reach out to other people that don't know Christ to, to minister and to, to be an encouragement because because it's powerful and it's effective. And listen, if you really want to affirm somebody, talk to them about the Savior of the world, Jesus Christ. Paul says, I'm, I'm thanking God for you. I'm thanking God for you. And I'm doing it continually. And I'm praying that you'll share your faith often. He's building people up. This last couple of weeks, I was talking to a friend of mine named Everett Sheppy. Everett lives in Austin, Texas. And he's a, a, a member of a church that I served a number of years ago. I haven't really seen him in person in a probably 10 plus years it's been a while but Everett is a great guy he's like in his late 70s he jogs every day he works 60 hours a week he's never been married before he's a real small little man he talks a million miles an hour and he's larger than life he's just having a great time on top of the world and I was talking to him on the phone this couple weeks ago and he said Ryan I still pray for you every single day just like that pray for you all the time pray for you man I was so encouraged wow Somebody is praying for me. Wow. That's pretty encouraging, isn't it? When we tell people that we're praying for them, it's a blessing. And here's the great thing about prayer. When you pray for somebody, you release the power of God into their life. There's a vertical aspect, but there's also a horizontal aspect. And then you tell them that you're praying for them. Then it just pumps them up. It motivates them. So when we pray for people, we got to tell them that we're praying for them because it inspires and motivates them all the more. And that's what Paul's doing here with Philemon. He is building him up. He is talking to God. And then he is telling Philemon, I am praying for you. You know, I covet your prayers as your pastor. I, I am not too proud to tell you I need your prayers. And I appreciate your prayers. And I, I love it when you tell me that you're praying for me. And I'll tell you what, one of my greatest honors is to pray for you. Every week when you turn in prayer requests on those connection cards, those yellow cards on the back, there's a prayer request section and if you have a prayer request this morning you want to turn in you can fill that card out and put put your prayer request and you will be prayed for and then we send a card out and many of you have received one of those cards it says prayer changes everything and then and then we sign those cards and we send those out and it affirms people and you know what people regularly say man thank you for that card what a blessing it is because it's building people up through the power through the power of prayer Paul did the same thing in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 16. He said, I have never stopped thanking God for you. I pray that you constantly are asking God, the glorious Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, to give you spiritual wisdom and understanding that you may grow in the knowledge of God. So you may think, I don't know how to pray for somebody else. Well, here's a great start based on Ephesians 1. Pray for the knowledge and the wisdom of God. Because when we have the knowledge and the wisdom of God, we can accomplish great, great things. When we need the wisdom and knowledge of God in our families and in our careers and in our finances and in our personal lives and, and everywhere we go, we need the wisdom and knowledge of God. So Paul's prayer for the Ephesian church is a great prayer for us to pray as well for others. 2 Thessalonians 1.3, the message says, thanking God over and over for you is is." not only a pleasure it is a must it's not optional paul says we have to do it your faith is growing phenomenally you your love for each other is developing wonderfully why it's only right that we give thanks paul says we need to be praying and prayer affirms people so you want to build great relationships you pray for others you serve others and then Paul gives us one more thing. Check this out. He says words that affirm. It's what we say. Words that affirm. Verses 4 and 5. I am always thinking, my God, as I remember you in my prayers, because I hear about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints. 
He says, man, I want to tell you straight up, your life is a blessing. Words that affirm. Words are so powerful. Wow. Words of affirmation. Man. I love Proverbs 25, 25. It says, good news from far away is like cold water to the thirsty. Paul had heard he was in another city, and he kept hearing about the faith of Philemon. Isn't that great? It's really awesome when you go to another place and somebody says to you, hey, man, I'm hearing great things. You kind of think, really? Wow. That's great. People are talking about me in another city? That's awesome. Wow. Words that affirm. And Paul expressed genuine appreciation to Philemon. Now, he's not just, he's not just trying to butter Philemon up because he's about to make the big ask. You could kind of read this and be kind of skeptical and cynical and say, well, he's just saying all this because he wants something in return. But notice he's specific about what he's giving him affirmation about. He says, your, uh, I hear about your love, your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints. He's specific. And listen, our affirmation to people, our words should be specific. We shouldn't just say, man, hey, you're a nice guy. We need to say, hey, I really appreciate you because of X, Y, and Z. And listen, when we give authentic, real-life affirmation, it is so powerful, it is, it is life-changing to so many people. A lot of people don't get any affirmation. I wonder how many, how many marriages would be totally transformed if the husband and the wife begin to practice these things that we're talking about today. Words of affirmation. Powerful. They need to be sincere and authentic. Now, if you came to me and you said, Ryan, I want to affirm you. You are a fantastic fisherman. I would look at you and laugh. I'd say, you're lying. You're just trying to flatter me. Several years ago, I was doing an illustration on the stage at the 11 o'clock service, and I had a, a big lure. It was about that long and had three tri hooks on it. In the course of the inner, the uh, illustration, I got both index fingers hooked in each end of the tri hooks. And I was having to preach like this. It was kind of awkward after a while, you know. What was even sadder is I couldn't get, everybody was afraid to come up on stage and, you know, relieve my pain. I was like begging people, you know, please spare me, you know, that kind of thing. People were just staring at me and laughing, you know. They thought it was part of the thing. It wasn't cool. One of our church members said afterwards, he said, Ryan, you may want to stick with basketball illustrations instead of fishing. I said, yeah, you're probably right. So we have officially banned all fishing illustrations from the stage. No more fishing. It's not good. We need to make our praise, our affirmation of individuals authentic and real. It needs to be specific. It needs to be direct. I love the word encourage. You know what the word encourage means? It means to inspire courage. When you encourage somebody, you inspire them to live courageously. Is that cool or what? I wonder how many people you are inspiring courage in. Somebody here today needs some courage. And your words of affirmation are going to build them up in such a way that they can face the tragedies and the trials and the adversity and the problems and the hardships of whatever's going on. Because you are inspiring courage by encouragement. When I was in college, I worked at this really cool fitness center. It was a really cool job. I only made like six bucks an hour, but it was a lot of fun working there. We had a lot of NBA teams that would come in when they were in town that would practice there, and a lot of uh, NFL football players and other professional athletes, college athletes would come by and work out and do all this stuff. And I worked at the front desk. It was a great college job, a lot of fun. I was going to transfer to the university after working there for about 15 months, it was about three hours away. And so I turned in my two-week notice to my boss, and my boss called in a panic. Ryan, you cannot quit. You are our number one front desk guy. You do an amazing job. You show up on time. You're good with people. You're not dramatic. You're always consistent. We appreciate you. You do a great job. You cannot leave. I was like, wow. I really appreciate that. Then I got off the phone, and I thought, that's so strange. Because I worked there 15 months, and nobody had ever told me I did a good job. Never! 
How weird is that? You're going to leave? You're a rock star, you know? On a normal day? Nada. Nothing. That's strange. I wonder how many relationships are like my relationship with my boss. People are doing a great job, but nobody's saying it. Nobody's building people up. Nobody's saying it in the office, and nobody's saying it in the home, and nobody's saying it in the neighborhood, and people aren't saying it in the church. And I wonder how we would begin to change our own experiences if we begin to heed the counsel here of the Apostle Paul, building people up. Many times we believe people are doing a great job, but it's just the fact that we don't say it, right? That's the problem. And affirmation is a huge part of this. You want to have great relationships, affirm people. It's much easier to point out faults, is it not? Much easier to go around with magnifying glass and, oh my goodness, they this and she that and all that. that that's, that's easier to do that. We do that naturally, don't we? But what if we began to look for the reasons to build people up rather than the, be, the, the reasons to tear people down and to criticize them? Words are powerful. Words of affirmation, positive things. Who has God placed in your life that you need to affirm today? You know, when I was in middle school, I went out for the track team as a seventh grader. The coach pulled me aside. He said, Ryan, you are not a sprinter. You're, you're running with the sprinters. You are definitely not a sprinter. I was like the last guy. It was so slow, you know. It was terrible. He goes, you look like a distance runner. You need to go with the distance guys tomorrow. I was like, yes, sir, coach. So. All of a sudden, I'm a distance runner. I'm in the seventh grade. If you know anything about track and field, you know that only three people from each school can compete in a given race at, at, at one track meet. So if you're the fourth fastest, there's no luck, you know. And I kind of worked my way up to become like the fourth fastest kid as a seventh grader, which meant that I got to go to no track meets except practice track meets, okay. So as a seventh grader, I'm not running. I'm just, you know, going to practice, running my brains out, but I don't get to go to the track meets. Well, the great thing was in the eighth grade, all of those guys that were bigger and faster and stronger than me, they all went to high school. And now I had an opportunity to, to, to be the fastest guy on the team. And my coach continued to affirm me, Ryan, you're a distance runner. You can be a winner. You can, you can, win. you can, you can be a gold medalist. You can set our school record. You know what? As the season went on, he was right. I set our middle school record in the two-mile run as an 8th grader, when I didn't even hardly make the team as a 7th grader, largely because my coach just continued to tell me that I was a champion. He began to convince me that I was going to win. Isn't that amazing? Words are so powerful. They're so powerful. And we need to use them to bring honor and glory to God. We need to bring specific affirmation. And listen, nobody affirmed people more than Jesus Christ. Jesus is dying on the cross, spear in his side, nails in his hands and his feet. What's he doing? He's saying to the thief, today you're going to be with me in paradise. Affirmation. When the woman brought one year's worth of wages that she had invested into a type of fine perfume and began to anoint Jesus' body and people were telling her she was foolish and wasteful, Jesus affirmed it. He said, what you've done has been beautiful. In John chapter 8, when the woman is caught in adultery and she's brought before Jesus and she's ready to be stoned, Jesus corrects the, her accusers and he looks at her and he says, go and sin no more. In other words, I believe in you. You can do it. Everywhere Jesus went, his words, his actions, his life were building people up. And that's the life that God wants us to live this morning as well. I want to give you an opportunity to meet the Savior Jesus Christ this morning. Maybe you've never begun a, a personal relationship with Him. It's about the power of the touch. God has reached out to us. God has touched us. And now we have an opportunity to open our hearts to Him today. Maybe you've never invited Christ to come into your life. You've never been His follower, His disciple. And this morning, God is moving in your heart. And today, you want to say, Man, I want to follow him. I want God to have all of my heart today. I want to ask us just to bow for a word of prayer. I know he's moving around and nobody's talking just for a moment. Let's just do business with God for just a moment. Just say this in your own heart. 
Today, if you'd like to open your heart to Jesus Christ and begin a relationship with him, Lord, please forgive me of my sins. Lord, please forgive me of my sins and make me a brand new person. Lord, please make me a brand new person. I'm putting my faith in you and all that you've done that I can have forgiveness and life eternal. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross and rising from the grave again on the third day. I invite you into my life to become my leader and my Lord. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.